sermon series where we're talking about everybody's favorite topic, money. You know, we don't like to talk about money in church. We don't like to talk about money with our spouse. We don't like to talk about money with our kids. We, we don't like to talk about money even sometimes with our financial planner. There's something about money, it makes us kind of cringe sometimes inside. You know, as we think about money, though, we remember that, that money is just an amoral thing. It's neither good nor, nor bad. It's just, it's just a thing. It's just an object. It can't do anything good. It can't do anything bad. But it can be used for good, and it can be used for bad. As we began the series last week, we were kind of framing it in this whole realm of understanding it as kind of a receipt. You know, you get a receipt in it as a sign that uh, something has taken place, an exchange has happened. Usually, you give the money to somebody, they give you a product, and you get a receipt for that product. Now, one way we get receipts that we looked at last week is in the things that we buy, the way we use our money, the things we, we spend our money on. And we recognize that sometimes when it comes to spending our money, we can be pretty, pretty foolish, right? And if you were here last week, all I'll say is beanie babies, right? If you were here last week, you understand. If not, you want to watch that message because I embarrass myself big time when I get beanie babies. But it's not just foolish ways we spend our money. Sometimes we're, sometimes we're foolish in ways we don't use our, our resources because we're, we're afraid that, that we won't have enough or fear kind of just makes us freeze when it comes to using the stuff God's entrusted to us. And a lot of that reason is because we get confused by size. We think that something big is actually something really small and, and something small is actually really big because the reminder is in the midst of it all that we've been washed in water and the word just like Gwendolyn was this morning and we've been given the very keys of the kingdom of God that God's greatest riches in Christ are ours and it's not something that is insufficient but rather something that is super abundant. And on top of that, he gives us even more of his stuff that to manage. And at the heart of what we're talking about today is not what we spend, but rather what we give. And I know one of the things that we think about is in church, and when we think about giving, you, you think about what happened a moment ago, that they're out there, the plates are put away, and the safe, and everything like that, but we think about offering, right? We think about tithes and offerings, and, that, and that's a part of it, and, and I'm glad that we've already had the offering in, in this service, that, that it's not like, I'm, we're not talking about this because we want to give more offering, it has nothing to do with that. In fact, what it has to do with it is what's at the heart of who you and I are. How we're created in the image of God. And I think one of that image of God thing that resonates with us is that you and I, we desire to be generous people. You do. You don't want to be somebody who's, who's greedy. You don't want to be somebody who lives with the assumption that everything you have is for your consumption. You want to be a generous person. It's just that sometimes we're not so good at that. Sometimes we do fall into the temptation of greed and, and the assumption that everything is for my consumption, and we find ourselves struggling with that. But I think at the heart of who we are as, as people and children of the, made in the image of God is that we want to be generous people. You know, I came across a story this week, and I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it's a pizza place in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania called Rosa's Fresh Pizza. I don't know if you've ever heard of Rosa's Fresh Pizza, but Rosa's Fresh Pizza became really famous because of where they're located in Philadelphia is a place and in a neighborhood that had a lot of homelessness, a lot of people who couldn't afford to eat uh, at the pizzeria. Now, they stayed in business because they still had plenty of paying customers that had happened in the neighborhood, and so what Rosa's came up with was an idea to pay it forward. And so any of their paying customers, as they came in to order, as they came in to pay for their pizzas, they could come up to the counter and they could and were asked, would you like to buy a slice of pizza for somebody else? And they weren't guilty. It was just an opportunity to do that. And many people said yes. And what they would do then is if you wanted to buy a pizza, a slice of pizza for somebody else, they would give you, you would give them money and they would give you a receipt. And the receipt was a post-it note. And you kind of see in the picture of there, what's all over the wall are post-it notes of people who have bought and per purchased, pre-purchased pizza slices for those who can't afford it. And on that post-it note, there's an encouraging word, an encouraging message from the person who made that donation. So that if you wanted a piece of pizza in Rosa's Fresh Pizza, you could just simply walk in and you didn't have to have any money. All you had to do was take one of the sticky notes off of the wall and you walk up to the counter and you exchange that sticky note, that receipt that somebody else paid for, and you got a fresh slice of pizza. 
Pretty cool concept, if you think about it, for a while in Rosa's Fresh Pizza, they, they lived that concept for a long time, although the reason I came across it was I found out Rosa's Pizza has actually closed because this past summer, because their rent became too high. It's not because people weren't generous. Look at all the pizza slices that were out there. It's just somebody else became too greedy in terms of what they could charge for their pizza and no longer could the pizza shop maintain their uh, fiscal responsibility and stay open. Now, roses may have closed, but something inside of us, we want to be generous people. We want to be generous people because we recognize that what we've been given isn't just for us. You know, sometimes that's how we use our time. And I was reminded of it this, this past, uh, past Sunday. Back out here, there's some like 15, 20 of the youth and I were, were out there and we were, working, we were working on something that was, kind of, well, it was something that was pretty hard. I don't know if you've ever had seen a five gallon bucket of paint stacked inside another five gallon bucket of paint and then multiply that by 50. Um, those things get stuck together. And the youth who I know, most of those youth, they might have a struggle cleaning their bedrooms at home. But last Sunday night, they, they were out there and they were scrubbing those pockets. They were getting them clean. They were getting as much paint out of it as they could because they were being generous with their time. Instead of being in Bible study, instead of having a snack or playing a game, they were there scrubbing those buckets so that those buckets could be used by somebody else, not by them. They didn't need the buckets. They have running water at their home. But they recognize that, that there's people just a few miles away away from us who, who don't have running water, who are waiting in the immigration process, and they need some things to help wash their clothes while they're, while they're waiting. And those buckets are out in Matamoros serving that purpose. We want to be generous people, but sometimes we just don't know how to do it. And so we convince ourselves that maybe generosity will be something that we'll do someday, someday when we have more or when we finally are secure or whatever answer we give to ourselves. But I think is what we're going to see this morning, and you can follow along on the, on the back of your outline there, on the back of the bulletin rather, there's an outline of the scripture passages that we're going to look at. And we're going to start by, by looking at a passage in the New Testament, and it's a letter that, that Paul wrote to the church in the city of Corinth. Now, it's the second time that he's written to this church in Corinth. This first time he gave them a lot of instruction. There was a lot of problems going on in the church. And in the second letter, there's still some problems going on. But he also does a lot of reporting to that Corinthian church. And one of the things that Paul reports on in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, is another church and the things that are happening on and there that he wanted the Corinthian church to know about. Here's what he writes. Verse 1 in chapter 8. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. During a severe trial brought about by affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So here Paul's writing to the Corinth church, and he's talking about the Macedonian church, which is on like the southern tip of Greece on the Mediterranean Sea. And what he's telling them is that something that's happened in the Macedonian church that has just shocked and surprised Paul, as he'll write about in a little bit. And what shocked and surprised them is the wealth of generosity being expressed by the Macedonian church. And that wealth of generosity is being expressed in an unusual formula. The formula he gives us there is this idea that there's this abundant joy that this congregation has, which you can understand, right? If you've ever been to a wedding, I was going to say, have you ever been to a wedding and not want to go? I mean, yes, we've all had those times where we've had to go. But most often, when you go to a wedding, it's joyful. So what do you bring with you? You bring a gift, right? You bring a present, and you don't bring it begrudgingly. You're, you're happy. You're going to help the new couple start off their life together. You do things when you're joy-filled. But then Paul adds this to the equation. Extreme poverty. That abundant joy plus their extreme poverty still equaled the wealth of generosity. Really? You see, extreme poverty, that's, that's an interesting thing. How can you be generous when you are extremely impoverished? Because we usually get confused about, about amounts, right? We'll think like, well, I'll be generous someday, you know, when, when my kids move out of the house, when the house is paid for, when the kids get through college, when my grandkids are safe and secure, when I finally saved enough for retirement, when I'm financially stable, whatever that might be. And, and we put in our minds and our thoughts that that, 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 that second part of the category, we, we've got a number in there or a comma that we want to move over another uh, column, hopefully, and, and then, then we'll be secure and then we can be generous. But the Macedonian church, they were abundantly joyous, even in their extreme poverty. 
and still were, had a wealth of generosity. It wasn't a matter of where the decimal point was or the comma was. It was a matter of the heart. And in that matter of the heart, Paul explains further in verse 3. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. You see, to understand what's going on is, is that Paul and other the missionaries, they've been gathering up an offering to send back to the, to the church in Jerusalem where there's some suffering and hardship taking place by the Christians that are living there. And in the midst of that, the Macedonians, who Paul says they are experiencing extreme poverty, that instead of saying, hey, what about us? What about us over here? We're really hurting too. They didn't say, what about us? They begged and pleaded not for an offering for themselves. They begged and pleaded to be a part of what was happening in the offering going to Jerusalem. They might not have had a lot as the world looks at it, but they weren't confused by that a lot way of thinking. They understood that generosity doesn't flow from obligation or force. Generosity flows from the heart. So let's look at what are some of the things that, that Paul points out here. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this passage. Three things I think that, that a spirit of generosity looks like when we think about it. And the first thing is that spirit of generosity is proportional. That's what we saw in the Macedonian church. It said that they gave according to their ability. Not somebody else's. Not their neighbors. Not the Corinthians. Not the Galatians. Not the church at Ephesus up the road. No, they gave according to their ability. This is clear. In fact, later on in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12, just a few verses later, Paul will say, a gift is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have, to what he has. To take stock of what that person has, that's what that gift is made, not in comparison to somebody else, but in looking at one's own self. It's why we teach and we talk about that, the biblical principle of the, of the tithe, which doesn't get confused by decimal points and commas, but it talks just about giving get back that, that first fruits, that first fruit, that what God gives to us and trusts to us, that we give back that, that first ten. So that if we get $10, we give back one. If we get $1,000, we give back 100 and it goes like that. We might get confused, but, but God's not confused. We have opportunity to, to bless others with what he's given to us. And probably one of the most dramatic examples of this happens during, during Holy Week. Now, if you think about Holy Week, that's the week where, where Jesus comes into town riding on a, on a donkey there, coming into Jerusalem. People are shouting Hosanna, taking off their outer garments, putting them on the road, cutting down palm branches and laying them for his donkey to ride over. I mean, this is an important week. On Friday, Jesus is going to die for the sins of the entire world. But you know what he's doing just two days before that? He's in church. He's at the temple. And you know what he's doing at the temple? Well, you don't, maybe. But Peter did, because he was there. And he told Mark. And Mark wrote it down in his gospel. Because I think he was surprised, too. Knowing what Jesus was going to do and what his mission was, that in the middle of all of these important things, Jesus is at the temple. And in Mark chapter 12, verse 41, we find out what he was doing. Jesus sat down in the temple opposite the treasury and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Ooh. I mean, you're about to die for the sins of the world and you're spending time sitting outside of the temple watching what people put in the offering box? You see, they didn't pass around a plate like we do or have online giving and all those kind of things. If, if you were giving an offering to the temple, there were these, there was these kind of cylinder, kind of cone-shaped things that were on the walls around the temple, and it was connected to the treasury, you know, kind of like a, a night deposit, you know, at the bank. You put your money in, and it goes all the way in, secure, safe, into the vault. And so if you're there, and your only method of money is these coins that are there, they make money. And so they're noticing that there's rich people go in there, they're putting a lot of money in there because you can hear it, chang, 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 you know, coming out like the coin star machines at H-E-B. Those things drive me crazy. You know, they make all of that noise and, and Jesus is there saying, watching what's going on. 
And he sees the rich people going by, and they put in a lot of stuff, and then this happens. Verse 42, a poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. Some translations say worth not even a penny. Summoning his disciples, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others, for they all gave out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now, I'm picturing this in my scene. This isn't in the Bible there, but I've got to think to myself that if Judas is there, because Judas is in charge of the money bag, he's kind of the treasurer for the disciples, he's probably thinking to himself, you know, Jesus is a really great miracle worker, and his teaching is phenomenal. But when it comes to math, he doesn't get it. That's not very much money. That's like not even a penny's worth. Jesus, we don't even sometimes pick up that money from the ground. You saw with the rich people, we heard it with our own ears, how much went in. But Jesus isn't confused by numbers or amounts. In fact, Jesus tells us something a little bit more, that it, she's giving not because of the amount she's giving, which others might not even notice. She's giving out of her heart. She's giving proportionally. And even beyond that, you know, I, I think beyond that is, is something that I think we should consider for a moment because when I hear this story, I, I right away go to what I, what I think of and maybe what you think of most often when we think of somebody who's described as being widowed. We think of somebody like that lady, don't we? She's got a cane, hunchback, barely made it up the steps to the temple because it's hard to get up there. But she puts her offering in. Did you ever think of her maybe... Being like the artist Sandra Rass, described her as. A young mom, four kids, husband's gone. You see, that's, that's the reality of Jesus' day. There's many widows who were 30 years old, 25 years old, four kids to raise, no income coming. And she comes to the temple that day. And she puts in what Jesus notices. Two small coins. Not a significant amount. But yet, a sign of the amount of what she was actually doing. And trusting God who cared for her. Just as we prayed in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. You know, it's not just proportional that she was being. She was being that the second thing I want to talk about is that she was being sacrificial. That a spirit of generosity, a wealth of generosity, is sacrificial. Paul told us about that in 2 Corinthians 8.3, that when he's describing the Macedonian church, they gave according to their ability, and not just that, but beyond their ability. Beyond their ability. That it cost them something. They had to give up something in order to do what they wanted to do in this offering that was coming by, to bless somebody else. Reminds me of that passage there in Galatians 6, verse 2 on the screen there as well that says, carry one another's burdens. Sometimes it's described as bear one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. You know, sometimes I think when we think of bearing one another's burdens, we don't realize that sometimes that means we're going to have to sacrifice. That it might cost us. I love how, how Jonathan Edwards, he's a 1700s, was a preacher in here in, in the 1700s. He wrote about this passage. I couldn't say it better than, than he said it. You've got to pay attention, but, but, but catch on what he's doing here. He says, we may be obliged to give to others when we cannot do it without suffering ourselves. Otherwise, how is the rule of bearing one another's burdens fulfilled? If we are never obliged to relieve others' burdens except when we can do it without burdening ourselves, then how do we bear our neighbor's burdens when we bear no burden at all? Is it bearing a burden if it doesn't cost us anything? If life just goes on as normal? Are we living as that widowed woman did, trusting ourselves into the mercy and care of God to provide? Or is it about me, my strength, my power? Bearing burdens sometimes means there's, there's a sacrifice to be paid. 
I was reminded about that because I was looking back at some of the, the history of, of this church right here. Our church, as you know, is, is probably about 90, I think if I count, 97, 98 years old. Now, we haven't always been at this location, but 57 years ago, this, this sanctuary was, was dedicated. I won't ask anybody to raise hands if they were here. There, oh, there might have been. Oh, I see one person. One person was here. Martha, Martha was here, so she can verify this story, and I have the records and the archives to, to prove, prove it as well if the memory doesn't serve you as well, uh, like mine doesn't always work for me. But as I was looking at that some 57 years ago in uh, October, actually the dedication was in uh, September, September 30th of, of 19, uh, what was it, year 1962, that's it, September 30th, 1962. And I was looking at some of the things that were happening during September and October because it was tough. It was really tough. The church was at another place, another location at that time. And they have listed in there all the, the sacrifice that, that was going on. In fact, they were going to every member's house because they, they made this, built this new facility. And it was great. There was people coming to it. And it was great that was happening. But it was tough. They, they were barely making it by. And there was people that were talking about. And there's listed in there the sacrifice that, that they made to, to make this happen. And I see that right away there was benefits and there was blessings that was happening because it wasn't but a month after this sanctuary that was dedicated, something significant happened in that the Lutheran Hour Ministries, which had been broadcast for, for many, many, many years, the very first broadcast that ever happened in Spanish happened right here. It's October 30th in 1962, heard by millions around the world every single day right now in their heart language of Espanol about the sacrifice to make that happen. And they sacrificed not knowing that, that you would be here 57 years later sitting in these pews enjoying the air conditioning and gathering as God's people, but they also recognized too that it wouldn't last forever. That there would be changes, the buildings change, and we recognize that just this past May in our voters meeting and when we unanimously adopted and passed the, the new master plan for, for this campus to better utilize the resources that God has given to us, recognizing that we need space. We need some space. We need some space to go to the bathroom. Let's be honest, right? We've known that for some time. We don't want to just fix the bathrooms. We recognize we need some space where we can gather together and, and have a cup of coffee and where the kids can run around and, and you're not worried about them running around and, and tripping in the narrow aisles. We need space that makes our campus more accessible to people with mobility issues. We want to be able to be have a place where we don't have to sit in the parking lot and hope people don't get hit by cars, but rather can actually today would be a really nice day to be out there. We want to be outside probably today because we got to enjoy the one day of fall that we get every year and it's just <laughs> too good to pass by. Maybe we can see about if those windows could open on there. We adopted that plan knowing that it's going to be a, a sacrifice for us. Knowing that as we're working on the financial plan for how we'll fund that ministry going forward, as we'll launch this winter and invite you to, to be a part of, we recognize. And I'm looking at it in my own finances and saying, you know, I want that to happen. What am I willing to, to give up or to do without so that God's kingdom can be a blessed? But it's not just about this church and in this place. It's part of our generosity. It's a holistic thing. It's a holistic thing and that holistic thing in that we want to be purposeful in our generosity too. We want it to make a difference. You, you heard him say that, Paul said it, I can testify that they gave according to their ability, they gave beyond their ability, but they gave it of their own accord. They weren't forced, they weren't coerced, they didn't have their arm twisted. Paul didn't say, give until it hurts. No, none of that, that's baloney. They gave according to their own accord. I like how he says it. He says it later on in this passage, in a chapter later in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He says it this way. Each one must give as he has made up in his mind. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. It should be a joyous thing. The Greek word for that word cheerful is, is the word that you probably, you know Greek. You know you know Greek. Hilarion, right? What word do you think we get from Hilarion. Hilarious, you know Greek, way to go. You're halfway there, you can go to Sam. Uh, hilarious, right? You think of hilarious, you think it's not just cheerful, it's like hilarious. I mean, you're, you're talking belly laughing, kind of excitement that Paul's talking about here, that this is an arm twist and this is an obligation, this isn't a painful thing. This is a joyous thing that we get to be a part of. And you know this in your generosity in your life. 
You know, I think about it at generosity. I think about grandparents. My, my parents are visiting right now, and I know my kids. They love it when grandpa and grandma come because grandma and grandpa are hilariously generous to their grandkids. You, you, you know this. You, have, have, you who are grandparents or, or you who send your kids to the grandparents, you know that when you send them to grandpa's and grandma's house, that the main thing the kids like is that they can go anywhere, do everything, and everything's going to be paid for. How great is this? They don't know how it gets paid for, but they know grandma and grandma got it taken care of. And I know what? If you're grandparents, I know this. You don't think to yourself, man, the stinking grandkids are coming over again. <laughs> Money tree, they just think it grows on it. No, you're like, sugar them up, have much fun, send them back home to mom and dad. I mean, that's what you love doing with them. You love to be cheerful givers. We love to be hilarious givers. But sometimes we let that, that spirit of generosity squelch within us because we get confused with numbers and commas and decimal points. We need to forget that our generosity is in the very image of the Father who's created us. I mean, think about this for a moment. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 3, if I give away all my possessions... If I give over my body to be burned, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. This isn't law motivation. This is the gospel. This is the love of God within me that is manifesting itself in the Macedonian church so that even in their extreme poverty, there is abundant joy and a wealth of generosity that is flowing from them because it's done out of love. It's an image of the gospel. It's what God does for us. I mean, here, here's a bunch of passages. I've got them listed there on your bulletin. So if you want to look them up later, you can dig into them deeper. But, but listen to these images. Then there's more we can look at. I picked five of them. Galatians 2.20. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 5 verse 2. Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Ephesians 5.25. As Christ loved the church and what did he do? He gave himself for her. And this one, this one I know you know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Giving is a part of who we are. And we can't outgive God. We can't pay him back. It's not the point. Our giving and our abundance and our generosity flows from without us so that when we see the things in the world that break our heart, we can respond because we've got that, that, that leverage to be able to do that. You know, in this series, one of the things I've been challenging you to do is just like the Macedonians gave out of their own ability, they were able to recognize what they have. My challenge for you in this series has been acknowledging those blessings that, that God has given to you. I've encouraged you last week to write them down on your bulletin and on your outline there. You can write them. But then there was those other ideas, like you could write them on a pumpkin. I know that I showed you this pumpkin last week. This is a, a generosity, a blessing pumpkin that a family had, had written. Some of the different things that they were thankful for. And they were thankful for indoor plumbing, which, you know, my illustration, the five-gallon buckets, you can understand that. They were in, thankful for their site and park, um, parks and our cars. They were, thank, they were thankful for Mondays. Is that what that really said? Yeah, they said Mondays too. But I think you're even thankful for Mondays if you actually can take stock of it. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying not to forget his benefits. His benefits to us. Not his benefits to somebody else. Not his benefits to our neighbor. Not his benefits to, to that person we wish we had what they had. No, we want to take stock to what he's given to us. And the psalmist reminds us it's easy to forget. So what's on your list? I was making my list this, this past week. I was writing it down, and, and I don't remember what day it was now, but I was, I was writing it down, and I made the list, and I started writing my list and writing down, you know, down people that I was thankful for. And the idea came to my mind, and I actually put it on the outline as a question, that asking you kind of what's the best gift you've ever been given? So I was kind of pre-thinking about what that was, and I was writing down my different things, and then it, and then it struck me. And I realized the best gift that I've ever been given, other than Jesus and for grace and forgiveness and mercy, all those things, yes, those top it all. But the best gift that I've ever been given was given to me by somebody I have never met. And it struck me. 
that the best gift I've ever been given was given to me by somebody I have never met. But who did something so courageous some 11 years ago. When she, in the midst of her own struggle and toil, recognized that raising her baby wasn't something that she could do. Made the toughest parenting choice, and it's a parenting choice, by placing her child for adoption. And that child was placed for adoption in my house. And as I thought about that, I've never been able to mate her, to, to, to say thank you for her. I could never repay her. I can't repay her life. But then I thought about how we picked his name. His name's Jonathan. And in Hebrew, Jonathan means gift of God. And every day, he's a reminder of the things the Lord has given to me. So what's on your list? See, my prayer is you see the list of the things that God has given to you, that others have given to you, that you don't see somebody else's generosity as something you have to pay back. You cannot pay God back for all of his generosity to you. But you might be through that generosity that you have. You might impact somebody else's life. You might be able to show them through your generosity, through your sacrifice, a father who loves them, a savior who died for them, and a kingdom that they can be a part of do simple water in the Word, a table they can be invited to, where they can join in the family dinner and be assured they are forgiven. They've been given the riches of the kingdom of heaven through a Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and who on top of that chooses to give us even more. So what's on your list? We're going to wrap this up next week. So if you want to be done talking with money, don't worry, we'll be done. What's on your list? What's on your blessings? Don't forget them. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, you're the greatest giver of all. I cannot outgive you. And when I find myself being consumed by the things you've entrusted to me, when greed creeps in, when I start thinking that all that you have given to me is for my consumption, lead me to your cross, where I see your great and your overflowing generosity, where you're covering me in love and mercy and forgiveness, where you're reminding me of my identity as your very own child. So guide my generosity so that through the generosity that you've allowed me to express, others may see you, Father, a generous God who loves his children and who has given everything so that we might be those children. So help us, Lord, to be proportionate, to be sacrificial, to be purposeful and intentional in our generosity for the sake, not just of ourselves, but for the sake of your kingdom. We ask it in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Please stand.